So this is the position specific project. In this project, we're going to focus specifically on the different positions in arena soccer. And you might have a specific outdoor soccer position or a futsal position that might be entirely different in the arena game. And that was something that, you know, I noticed as a player, I was a pretty versatile player where I played multiple positions. I wasn't just a forward or just a center back. Um, I used to tell coaches my most attacking position first because I felt I was more likely to make a roster. Uh, whenever coaches make rosters, they I just feel like in general uh, for outdoor soccer, they make rosters without consideration for defenders where, you know, your starting four defenders typically stay in the entire game. You don't really sub out a defender unless you're losing the game. And if you're losing, you would sub in an attacking player. Very rarely would a team take a bunch of defenders that aren't in their starting 11. So with that, you know, you have 11 field players uh, in outdoor. You have a backup goalie. That makes 12. And then you have some attacking players that might get subbed on, um, you know, a couple forwards, a couple wingers, maybe a center mid that can step in. But really, a lot of times when coaches were making 18-man rosters for games, I'd get left off because they would only put one defender on the bench because if they really needed to clean something up, uh, they could always push a center midfielder back and have him sit more defensive or a defensive center midfielder step back into the, the mix to close out a game. Uh, they didn't really sub on a defender very frequently. So with that, I would always tell coaches my most attacking position. I'd tell them, look, I'm a center forward, but I have a lot of experience playing as a center back, an outside back, as well as uh, an outside midfielder. And I, I would I would tell them that. And, uh, the reason why I would tell them that is so I would be more likely to make rosters. If you're looking at the roster and they say, oh, you know what, that guy is a pretty defensive-minded player. Um, when you tell the coach you're a defender, he typically doesn't put you in the attack in like the shooting drills. So if I'm never put in the shooting drills, I can't show coach that I can also put the ball in the back of the net. So I would always just tell them my most attacking position, but also say I can also play these positions. Because when I first got to college, they asked me what position I played. I said I was a forward. And everyone said they were a forward. And everyone thought they were a forward. And even though I thought I was one of the better forwards on the team, everyone were fighting for that position. And no one wanted to play defense. And the coach wouldn't sub the defenders. So with that, I'd say all that because your position of what you think you might be uh, in outdoor soccer or futsal, that might not be your position in arena soccer. And if you play one position and one position only, you're not as valuable when we're making rosters, to be honest. Um, if I'm looking at the final decision between a player, know that this is a physical sport and just about every single game, there has to be some shift to the line because someone's gone down with an injury or someone's just really exhausted or maybe someone isn't feeling well. Like that happens all the time. So if I have a versatile line three and players that can step in, step out the different positions, then that helps me be able to plan better for what might possibly happen. So, you know, if you say, hey, Josh, I'm only a target forward. That's the only position that I will play. Well, we typically only have two or three target forwards that we bring to a game. But if you say, oh, well, I can also play in the midfield. Well, there's a ton of options in the midfield and, and as a defender and being able to drop back. And you might not realize this, but even as a midfielder, you might be the furthest one back on the field at times. So we'll talk more about the arena game and the specifics behind it. And I even think some players that played the entire season last year still don't recognize this. So we're going to go into this more specifically. Um, but before we do, um, I want to showcase Tommy here, right? This is a nice picture of Tommy winding up to, to play a ball down the field. Tommy Humphreys there. Uh, there is uh, just build up that happens, as we mentioned, a lot that happens in zone two, especially if the other team is pressing. And let's say we built the ball out of zone one. This is our goalkeeper. Um, this is our typical setup. We have one player that's furthest back. 
we have two wide options on the left and right. We have an option that's not super sucked in too far up the field. If he comes way too far into here, he brings a defender with him, creates extra pressure. That's unnecessary. So he's hanging out somewhere in the middle of zone three. And this guy's right at the top of the D, ready to move each direction. So this player can play a ball into this lane for him to pick up and this lane for him to pick up. And this guy can be the first one to support him. I say that because just because you find yourself in this position right here, doesn't mean that you're never going to score goals. Actually, if you look at teams like I'm thinking like the Baltimore Blast, for example, you see people like Mello or Juan Pereira or even uh, Tony Donatelli at times check back into this position and play the ball into these channels and then be the one that attacks and scores the goal. You know, just because you find yourself here, remember we attack with three. If you get the ball and you know you're playing the ball there, if you play that ball and start sprinting into that area, this guy is going to advance but stay home still. We only attack with three and we have two drop options, right? So just because you get the ball here, that doesn't mean that you are positioned in that spot forever and will not move. That does not make you a defender. But do know that if you lose the ball, you better be winning that ball back and playing defense. So we might sometimes put players that are more skillful on the ball or have a better touch and are more confident on the ball who cycle back to receive the ball in that position. So that way they can play a ball up into the corner and then be the first to attack. It's a bit of a longer run, but it might help our team out if you're able to, to go collect that ball in that position and play a ball into these channels. Um, that's not always the case, you know. Sometimes uh, you might get the ball and play that ball into the corner and there'll be other supporting options that are there first and you slide in. Um, one common thing that we want though is we want players to recognize that, hey, look, there are times where I might not be the player that's taking all the shots. Or if you are not an attacking minded player, Maybe you aren't the first one to advance. If you see someone like, I don't know, I'll think of, I got Ken as an example, right? If Ken were to get the ball back here and play the ball in, right? And we have two defensive minded players that are right here. Let's not have one of you guys step into the box, recognize unless Ken is really tired and can't make that run. Um, Ken might be the one that advances into this final third. Uh, and then once the ball is collected in the corner, everyone advances up the field and we're possessing in zone three. And you still might get an opportunity if you're not the first person to advance in here. You might receive the ball. We might dump the ball in the corner. One, two, and three be set up here. We get the ball out here, switch it back to the other side. And this originally be you. And you get an open look on goal and take it and score. Right? And that's the awesome thing about this is it's not like, as a defender and outdoor, you're hardly ever going to score goals unless you go up for a set piece. That's not the case in this game, right? Everyone attacks, really. Everyone has to be offensive minded. Everyone also has to play defense. Um, if you only play offense, then there's no role for you here, right? We have players that come in every single year that only want to play offense and play zero defense. And no matter how many goals you score, if you're letting up goals because you're not tracking back, you just won't see the field. That's the honest truth. Um, if you are, you know, beating people on the dribble every single time and taking shots and then not tracking back and they score, doesn't matter how many go in. I'm more worried about you not tracking back and you not doing your job. So knowing that we all play defense, we all go up, we all go back. We're all defenders. We're, we're all attacking players. Once the ball is in the final third, once the ball is in the, sorry, in the final third, the final fourth of the field in the zone four, we attack with three, but we also have drop options that can be used. So just recognizing that um, positions are a little bit different in the arena game. Um, okay. And this is where I'm going to need your help. Okay. I listed out goalkeepers defenders, midfielders, and forwards, um, as well as some roles, which we'll get into in, in a few minutes. But really, um, I'm going to ask for your input, okay? And this is what I'm going to show you to first start off with. So for goalkeepers, I'm not a goalkeeper, right? I step in sometimes for six attacker uh, to play as the goalkeeper. I'll, I'll make a couple of saves. I'll let a few go in. 
Um, my goal against average probably isn't very good. Um, don't be modest. Um, so with that, I, um, I don't know everything there is to know about goalkeeping. I don't, especially I've never played at the next level. I've played every other position. I've just never played as a goalkeeper before. So I relate a lot off of what I know based off of my experience on playing arena soccer with players that play goal. And then also from what I see, uh, I'm a visual learner. I like watching a lot of film. I watch a lot of uh, arena soccer film and I watch a lot of futsal. I enjoy that a lot more than watching outdoor soccer. Um, so with that, there are things I pick up on, but I don't know everything, but I do know there are differences between playing outdoor soccer and arena soccer, especially for goalies. And I asked, well, I didn't ask you guys, but I ask you, I ask you guys now, um, just take a look at this. This isn't a comprehensive list, but there's something on here that I didn't put. Let me know and I'll put it on here. Um, so goalkeepers take a close look at this. Okay. I said, if you're a goalkeeper, some differences between the outdoor game or futsal in general and arena soccer. So the goal is smaller than outdoor goal and bigger than a futsal goal, right? Um, there are rebounds that you're not used to as a futsal goalkeeper or an outdoor goalkeeper. The ball goes past the goal in outdoor or futsal, play is done. The ball goes past you in arena soccer, it might be shot right back at you in 0.2 seconds, right? That's the reality of it. Um, so there are rebounds in the arena soccer game. Um, Josh at goal season, Brian attacker. Yeah, Brian and target forward. I've offered my services. <laughs> the, um, Brian has scored a major league futsal goal. Let that be known. Um, in 2018, major league futsal came to the mid Atlantic region, and Brian Gruder did score a goal. Let that be see, known. See, I, I again. Uh, my scoring it's, it's all using my intelligence i let gavin do all the hard work and i just sit at the far post and tap it in yeah well that brian was playing in goal i believe when he scored that goal which makes it <laughs> he scored a back post tap in as a goalie um anyway so if you guys pick up on anything and want to add it let me know even people who aren't goalkeepers some things to be aware of just like Think of this as like, even if you know it, something to share to someone that's never played arena soccer before. Um, clearances, you can't just clear the ball as far as you want. Three line violation, top of art violation. I'll go ahead and put that. Okay. Um, when a goalkeeper gets trapped and maybe the, they get the ball right on the edge of their goal, let's say right here. Uh, the goalkeeper, uh, in a lot of cases, you'll see them play this ball around the boards where they'll aim like right here. They won't aim over here. They'll aim like right here and just blast it as hard as they can. And the ball will ride around and end up like somewhere over here. So like they might get pressed really hard from this angle right here and not really have the confidence or maybe even the time to switch over this way. So they'll just blast it as hard as they can at like the wall right here. And with the curved wall, it like hits there. It then like hits here and then ends up rolling around, which isn't the worst thing in the world to do. Even the best goalkeepers in the league do it when they're pressed from different angles. So um, I included an example of that. If you guys click that, that's a video right there, example of it happening in a game. I'm sure there's many examples, but that was just one that I saw that I added um you know um as a goalkeeper uh part of your skill set needs to be to be able to when there isn't pressure to be able to advance the ball in the zone two and play a ball into the corner at the next level that's what is preferred to be honest uh goalkeepers that have confidence and you know if you go to an masl training session um and very frequently, the goalies are focusing on that ball that's being sent into that corner uh, and being able to play that ball consistently over and over and over and over again. Um, the blast goalkeeper, yeah, and that's something that's practiced a lot, right? Um, a lot of times, the blast goalkeeper, he's using uh, William Van Zela as an example, um, he'll roll the ball out here, he'll immediately start running here, 
they'll play him. He'll get the ball and just play this ball in this corner, right? A lot of goalkeepers do it. He's an example I'm sure you guys have seen a lot because Baltimore is local to here. <laughs> um, so with that, um, I already put that in there, three lines. Uh, they have a touch limit. Um, from the time that they roll the ball out, they can only touch the ball once with their feet. And then that possession, once they get rid of it, they uh, can't touch it again until the other team touches the ball or uh, loss of possession or the ball goes out of play. Uh, and there's also um, a time limit. Is it four seconds or five? Uh, five. I mean, you'll, you'll hear them count. Yeah. So when the goalkeeper has the ball at his feet, he has five seconds to get rid of it. It's literally like the one thing that MASL refs do well is announce their counting and where in the count they are. Yeah. Um, and then also just they need to be good communicators. They need to be talking. This goes for all different levels of goalkeeping, outdoor, futsal. Um, but especially in the arena soccer game, um, given that it's a lot smaller of a field than outdoor soccer, um, there's a lot more that can be heard. And, you know, with the ball always moving around and they're not being off sides. I think that's a, another big one since there's no offside. Um, with that, you know, there might be a player that's behind you that receives the ball. Uh, there needs to be communication. Uh, the ball is not going to go out of play in some cases where normally you could ride the ball out and let it go out of play. The goalkeeper needs to let you know, hey, there's a guy coming. So communication needs to be big. I saw um, Lucas raise his hand. Uh, just like I meant to wait until – just like you were done. Sorry about that. But basically, no, no, you're good. I'm done. I'm done. Okay. Just like going back to rebounds. Uh, and like maybe this will change depending, like, the just like just like the level of goalkeeper. But with that arena ball going like at like 70 miles per hour at least, uh, just like there will not be much catching going on unless it's like a front smother. But like even then, so just like this is like for like the field players, just like. Sometimes you may want to treat a rebound just like when the ball hits the wall or just like just like it may be almost the exact same or just like just because you see it going right at the keeper isn't necessarily a guarantee that it'll be a catch. Right. Unless the keeper's yeah. like insane, but just like in general. Right. No, since it's a lot shorter shots that are being taken, a smaller goal. Um, in like I mean I know in futsal it happens like more frequently there's a lot less like catching the ball and more of just like putting your body in front of it deflecting it so I'm trying to think of the right verbiage to use here maybe I'll say um less clean saves maybe I can call that um and balls will I guess that can be part of rebounds there. Um, balls will stay in play. And maybe I can add something like – right, something like that. Anything else, goalkeepers, that – I mean, some of you guys have played throughout the past year that you would say if you were talking to other goalkeepers, some advice. Pat? Pat just likes to think he's a goal. Look at our reaction saves. So, both for goalkeepers and defenders, it's important to recognize that a lot of those reaction saves, they're not necessarily going to be pushed into less dangerous positions. So, you have to be ready for those rebounds, essentially. So, be ready for like, I, I don't know if we could call it like a red zone turnover exactly, but a lot for goalkeepers trying to push them out of the center and into those corners will help. But for defenders, you have to be ready for those rebounds that are in the middle. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I can, I added more reaction saves. That's a good point, Pat. Or just like, I'll just say specifically rebounds in the box. Um, or center. 
one of the things I would add, I, I guess here, even though I think it applies to everyone kind of equally, and we haven't really spoken about it, um, restarts. If there's a foul, be careful because the other teams can essentially take them immediately. And the referees, in theory, should allow it within three feet, but in our experience last year, allow it pretty liberally. And so what was happening is we're being too nice we're fouling them in our defensive quarter, and we're already reacting as if they're going to push us back the five yards. And so then, you know, if I'm as keeper, I'm wanting you to take the, the near post, but I'm not quite sure where your positioning is, but I, I'm, I have to cover the far post. And I, if I leave the far post, it then leaves that open for the person to take a shot. So please, if you do foul, particularly in the defensive quarter, just stand in front of the ball, make the ref move you, make sure there's not that instantaneous restart because it, we definitely were on the wrong end a couple of times. And I think the refs did not help us out, but we can avoid that by just staying in front of the ball, make the ref move you. So, no, I think it's a good point. You know, I was watching, I've been watching a lot of MASL recently. And, um, <clears throat> you know, when the ball goes out of play in most of these arenas in the MASL one, uh, you know, there's time to recover the ball and bring the ball back in play and then set it down. But once the ball gets back in play, the refs do a fairly good job of like getting it quickly. I'm guessing they've been told this very frequently. It's like when the ball gets back in, put it back in play and let's go as quick as possible. Because that same thing applies to the MASL three that, that we play in. Um, but the ball doesn't go out of play and the refs just like, they put it down pretty quickly and they're like, go. And like, I've, I've, Cause it's the yeah. easiest thing they can do. Right. The, the ball, it's already there. Like the ball doesn't go out and the referee gets the ball, puts it down and just like one, two, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We haven't set where like, you'll see in the MASL a top of arc reset. Like they're not rushing. The team isn't rushing to like get in their positions. Um, because you know they have time that ball the top of arc reset means it was played in the stands and so the players go there and start setting up and eventually the ball gets there but once it gets there those refs like they get the ball they'll put it down and they'll put and go but our problem is this in the arenas in the places that we play like the ball goes out of play and the referee goes and grabs that ball doesn't wait, goes and sets it down, starts counting. And some of you guys are like subbing off the field. Some of you guys are um, not paying attention, not in your position. So like when that ball goes up out for top of the arc reset, you need to like sprint up the field and get in your position. Cause I don't know how many times last year, cause uh, unless, unless the other team is standing right in front of the ball and they need to get moved back which is like the only reason why the ref would delay it a couple seconds. Cause there's times where like, we've like not been in position whatsoever. And then we have a terrible like restart off of it. We're at the times where we are set up and ready to go, which is going to lead into set pieces in the coming, uh, the coming weeks, right? We need to get up there quickly. So the quick restarts are important as much defensively from a goalkeeper's perspective as they are an attacking perspective. Know that the ref's going to go and he's going to set that ball down and he's going to start counting. Um, so be ready for that. But uh, our way of stopping that quick restart defensively is to stand in front of the ball, right? To get in front of the ball and then they'll move you back. So good point there. Um, anything else we want to add about goalkeepers before we move on to the defenders? We'll take that as a no. Uh, if there is anything that we think of, just let me know, uh, even afterwards, and I'll update it. Okay, defenders. You know, I went through this list expecting that people would also contribute. This isn't a comprehensive list. This is just things that popped into my head immediately. And then knowing that I'm not the all-knowing authority for everything, I'd like input, um, but just things that popped in my head from a defender perspective. Same thing goes as goalkeepers, the clearances, right? You got to watch your three line. You got to watch your top of arc. Um, you know, goalkeepers get put into a lot of pressure in situations where, you know, in futsal or outdoor, they can play a long diagonal ball 
but that be a three line violation here or, you know, kick the ball out of play and that not be a huge cost to them. But here it is. Um, I'll take this out here. Um, I mentioned this in the beginning, but, you know, you may be in the attack and one of the attacking three don't think don't get all like moody because you got put in the the back three. You might think, oh, I'm in the I'm an I'm a defender. Right. Some of the defenders in the league are the leading scorers. Just saying um, there are players. I know when I played, there was a guy, not Josh Hughes, but there was a player named Jeff Hughes. And he played for Cincinnati and then eventually ended up playing for San Diego. Um, there used to be a team called the Cincinnati Kings, Cincinnati Kings. And then there uh, he went to go play for the San Diego Soccers. And he was a defender and he led the league in scoring and he would play that ball, getting up the attack. He could just bang the ball really hard. Uh, and he scored a ton of goals uh, from just getting that ball and playing. So like, if you think that, Oh, I'm, I'm not a defender. I can't play this position. Well, one, then that means you're probably not going to get rostered anyway. Um, two, everyone plays defense and three, you might actually be scoring goals from this position, Right. People might not track you because you're further back in the field. How many times last year did a player on the other team check back into this position, a, an attacking player, play the ball to the target forward, make a full field sprint down here, and him just really just outrun his mark for a wide open shot? Pretty frequently, right? So so with that, don't feel like, oh, I'm a defender. I'm in this back three. You know, Josh doesn't think I can score goals. That's not saying everyone runs forward. We still only attack with three, but recognize that you may be entering the attack. That's different, you know? Uh, so also a lot of communication, as I mentioned from the goalkeeper, also communication needs to become from defenders, people in the back. They need to be organizing defensively, but also talking to other people, letting them know, hey, drop back a little bit. We can't have four guys in the attack. You got to get back. And that communication needs to come from defensive players. Uh, and something to look for, you know, those balls in the zone four of zone two and the zone four ball is, is very common and a ball that needs to constantly be looked for into the corner. Um, Coy mentioned, uh, take away the boards when defending. Um, yes. So I'll add that too for defenders. Um, take away the boards and, and with that, with that too, like I'd say, take away the boards in zone two um and i'd say zone three but there are some situations where like if someone isn't an experienced player and you know isn't as strong as you and maybe is making an angled run into the boards then that's when you want to be able to like, I don't know, like let him go there. So that way you can just step between him and the boards. So to recognize that, because once they get in zone four, right, you still want to obviously take away the boards, but there are times where if a player is all left footed and I'll say this too, recognize if a guy's all left footed and he is on the left side of the field and has an awful right footed shot right maybe we or sorry if he's on the right side of the field and has an awful right footed shot maybe we let him advance the ball a little bit into the attacking uh i guess the the zone four uh and try to take that right footed shot rather than cutting into his left so recognizing what your defensive strategy looks like from there uh in different zones um Anyone else? Defenders, anything we want to add here? Uh, well, when defending uh, the goalkeeper, listen to Brian because Brian can see everything. So just basically have your ears open to what he's calling out. Okay, so listen to the goalkeeper. Um, I think that goes for every, every player in general, but given that the defender is closest to the goalkeeper, maybe we can say um, add into communication. I can say... Um, communicate to players in front of you and communicate closely with the goalkeeper. 
And I think one of the biggest areas that they'll probably, as a practical point, is probably if they switch to two target forwards instead of one, and it, depending on how we're defending that. So in those cases, it's important not just, you know, particularly for the keeper and then the back three defenders that might be involved in marking those two. Okay, so I'll say whereabouts of forwards and I'll say number of as well. Whereabouts slash number. I assume we probably go for everybody, but don't get offense to anything said. <laughs> Everybody's screaming everything just to make sure. So yeah, no, I think that I think that goes into some general communication. Um, listen to your keeper. No, I agree. Uh, communicate closely with the keeper, I think, uh, is is a good one. Uh, I know Jose has his hand raised. Uh, personally, for me, I love when people step really hard on the side of the board. And it literally just takes you off the play. And I can turn and hit towards goal. So I yeah. would say don't overcommit when pressuring a forward because it's easy to turn you when you're all in, especially towards the board. Yeah, the, and the, this is coming from a target forwards perspective in Jose. He's saying he loves, um, I'm assuming that like you get the ball and your back's a goal and the board is on your right. If that player tries committing too high on the board, like even if you're showing the ball on that side, that allows yep. him to roll into his right foot for a right-footed shot. So, um, no, yeah. yeah. So, contain, contain me and just keep me facing backwards. That's the best you can do as a defender. Don't get turned and, and allow for a shot. I'll say contain, don't get turned. And something also that just goes in general for all players, but we'll say for defenders specifically, is you don't have to win the ball. You know, you, you can just force them backwards um, and win that battle. You don't have to, like, step in and win that ball. Um, Beretti, Ber uh, I'd like to add that Beretti does a good job of that. Um, he is very good containing and just being patient. Yeah. I think uh, I think Tommy does a really good job, too, um, yeah. specifically. Uh, I know um, – there are times where you just, if you overcommit, even, I mean, there are players even that we have that like do a really good job of, of like at least letting the player know that you're there. But sometimes if you're just like, and Lukas mentioned, uh, don't be overzealous on intercepting the ball. If you step too hard to intercept it and that just goes in there, I have, you don't have to win the ball. Um, that's not just, I'll say um, on the dribble or intercepting a pass. Like, it's not necessarily your job. I remember I mentioned this maybe last week, I think, where in my very first arena soccer game I ever played in, in MASL, I was playing against the Harrisburg Heat. And, um, you know, I was signed on – I was signed on a Thursday, and we had a Saturday game. And I think I only had two training sessions before stepping in. It was mid-season I was signed. And I we ended up traveling to Harrisburg. And I was defending this guy. They played a pass in. My first thought was to step around him. He was a lot bigger than me. He literally just took one step and just like cut off that lane, threw his back into me, which made me almost trip up. And he just received the ball on his back foot facing the goal and just took one touch and shot it and scored. And you know, I subbed off and my coach just like ripped into me. And I just listened and I said, yeah, I, I messed up there. I tried to intercept the pass that an outdoor, maybe I would commit to and be the guy, but you know, in the outdoor game, a lot, or sorry, in the arena soccer game, a lot of these targets, like even throughout, even throughout the first division, like a lot of them are just like big dudes, you know, guys that wouldn't, you'd see, wouldn't see playing outdoor soccer just because they can't move as much. Um, but like, there are some really big guys, like you don't have to be like super fit to play a target forward position in arena soccer. If you can hold the ball up and have a good shot, 
um you know there's a lot of a lot of guys that just like are, are big dudes that hold the ball up really well so you don't have to win the ball from them you can just force them backwards so that's a very good point jose from a from a forwards perspective and i honestly think like that's what made me a better defender was i transitioned uh in my career from being a forward to a defender and i've always like gone back and forth uh, as a forward defender, forward defender, but it made me a better center back when I played outdoor, knowing runs I would make as a forward, knowing tendencies that I would have. So even if forwards want to chime in of what they prefer or things that work for them, so that way we can defend that. Um, Pat also has his hand raised. Be aware of how many fouls you give away. I remember earlier in the season, I got because I think it's four fouls for a blue, six fouls to be fouled out, right? That foul, right? Yeah, four for a blue and one half. So if you get four fouls, one half to blue. If you get six in the entire game, you foul out just like basketball. And you and get the foul. six the six fouls are pretty easy to come by. That because it's pretty much any foul, even if it's a the slightest clip in the world and they call it. I think there was one game where I got the five fouls. And that's where I, was, I think I was still in the third quarter. So you have to be aware of like where you are on the, the field, especially when it comes to boarding. It seems like refs are, except for us, more likely to give any touch into the board. And guys are going to be smart enough to try to exaggerate it. Oh, yeah. I mean, our very first, uh, our very first goal of the MASL season came off of a ball that was rolling around the boards. I saw the guy coming and the guy gave me a little bit of a shoulder, but I was right next to the boards. If you slam into a wall, palms first, it makes a pretty loud noise, right? Even though I was bumped a little bit, boom, slam on the boards, go down the ground. That's an automatic blue card, right? And we, we scored off of the, the next free kick. So um, with that, recognize that smarter players know this, that boarding is a blue card. And then if you're near the board, some players just push the ball as fast as they can and run as fast as they can down the boards because they know if you touch them, they're going to fly into the boards. Anything else we want to add about defenders? Anything else? Josh, just real quick. Um, the one thing that I thought of that I don't think has come up yet is just around help defense, which I know I have <laughs> mentioned that a couple times lately. But I think that as the, the center back or kind of the, the primary defender, that's a huge thing, um, especially when it's a zone defense. But even if it's man to man and you see someone get beat, you know, you can't just stick by the target forward and let the guy who's running free dribble, you know, in for a breakaway. So help defense and kind of all the things that go with that, which also ties in, of course, with quick communication. Um, that's just the one thing I thought of that that hasn't come up yet. Okay, no, I agree. I'm typing this in right now. If someone on your team gets beat, you may have to leave your man. Um leave your man to cut down the angle and step to attacking player okay so let me let me um let me first Brady. great point um help defense is something that I know Brady has brought up and it's a something that comes very frequently in basketball uh, in sports where you don't have as much space to occupy. Um, you know, if you're playing man to man defense in basketball and you get beat first, your first reaction is, Oh, I'm just going to stand here. It's to drop. But when you drop, you are going to drop more towards the middle of the court and someone else is going to step and take your man. Now, in the process of that, they're going to leave their man, unfortunately. So, you know, you might have to cut down the angle. You might have to step in a certain way to leave your man. But the ultimate thought is, hopefully I can slow them down long enough for the guy that got beat to track back. So, um, cut down the angle, except the attacking player and slow them down. Because like you think about it in outdoor soccer, I'll give an example, right? Let's imagine this is an outdoor field. And let's say um, this is a player on the attacking team going this way and you step to them and Mbappe just pushes the ball past you and runs, right? 
And let's say, let's say this is you defensively or another player defensively, that player typically slides and plays help defense while you track back into the middle of the box here, right? Or even if, if it's just a pass, like, right, even if this guy plays a pass down the line, right, and it beats you, you're not going to just run straight back to the ball. This guy picks up the ball and this guy drops back into the box because this guy technically is close to the ball now. He then goes, um, and if you do get Beal and Dribble in this case in the arena soccer game, right, um, and, and this guy's heading this way and beats you, someone else might have to leave their man in step and that ball might be played to a back post tap in. It might, right? But the main thing is being able to slow him down, cut off his angle, and at least provide support. Because if you just watch him and he just dribbles right to the goal, you can't just say, oh, well, that was your man. You got beat. Yeah, that, that is true. That man did get beat. And that is his fault. But what did you do to help restore the situation, right? Did you do anything? And it's funny because there are times where it might look like it's your fault. Like, I don't know how many times, like, like if you go back in the film and look where a player gets beat, one man leaves his man and then steps and then the ball get played back post to someone that's wide open and tap it in. And then like the goalie say like, that's your man. How come you let him score? And you're like, well, like I had to step to him. I had two guys. That's it. That's the definition. I have two men, right? Sometimes you have two men because someone's not paying attention, or sometimes you have two men because you step to provide help defense to slow down the play. It's not your fault. You did your best. You might look like it was, it might look like it was your fault because you ended up stepping to them, but it wasn't your man. And you have to sometimes risk it, right? Um, that's why we don't want to get beat in the first place. But, you know, you make the first mistake. Okay. Don't make the second mistake. The second mistake would be putting your head down, not tracking back after you get beat. All right. Or just throwing your hands up in the air and just not caring because that will get you a quick move out of the lineup pretty quickly. Um, so great point, Brady. Uh, anything else that you want to add to that point? Anyone else want to add anything to that? Yeah, no, I think you co covered it really well. It's really just about trying to buy even just like a second or two, like you said, for that initial person to recover. So it's it's just something that has to happen or else again, you have a guy just walk in straight on goal yeah. for a breakaway. Slow him down, cut off his angle, right? Um, I think that's two main things. And if in the meantime, maybe it's even a third defender that can track back and he might pick up someone else and that's great. Um, but recognizing that's important. Anything else from defenders you want to add? Okay. If you guys do think of something or want to add something, I can always add that. Um, midfielders. Midfielders. Um, just some things I've added. Once again, um, this isn't a comprehensive list. So I want you guys to, to chime in here, especially if you've played midfield. Um, you know, it's different from being an outdoor midfielder, right? As an outdoor midfielder, you might not have much responsive or much defensive responsibility. You might have a ton of resp defensive responsibility, depending if you're a defensive center midfielder, attacking center midfielder. Um, you know, you might come in and say, hey, I'm a winger, right? Well, there isn't really a winger position in arena soccer. Um, you're a midfielder, you're gonna be put under pressure um, now you might be really good on the ball, uh, which means that you might find yourself in one of the back three positions. Um, now, just because you're a defender, like I said before, that doesn't mean you're not going to advance the attack, but it's just different from being a midfielder and outdoor. It's different. You come in and say you're a midfielder. Well, what does that mean? And we need to figure that out because if you say, oh, well, I, I played as a defensive center midfielder in college and my job was just to clean up the attack and just blast everything out and win every ball, right? That actually might be useful, but might not be seen as a midfielder. There's players that play as center backs and outdoor and then they get to the arena game and then they're really good target forwards because they're just so good at holding the ball up and aggressive and they're just big monsters that just post up. So just letting you guys know that. Um, 
you know, you may receive the ball as the last player back. That doesn't mean you're a defender, but that's just how those three cycle in the back. Um, sometimes you're defensive. Sometimes you might be more attacking, right? If you find yourself as, hey, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a center attacking midfielder. I'm a number 10. Well, you know, you might not be a second forward, which we'll talk about later. Um, we might put you in one of the back three positions and you might play defense a little bit more. Everyone plays defense, but you might have to play a little bit more defensive or sometimes you might be more attacking minded uh, and be up in the attack in those three attacking a lot of times. Um, but just don't force your way into the attack, I guess is what I'm saying. And don't feel like betrayed if you don't get some if, if, if we if we recognize throughout the game, hey, look, we need to get this player forward more. And there's times where we have had to do that. Uh, we might move you as a second forward or rearrange our target combination. Um, I said for midfielders, it's better to advance the ball up the boards on the dribble into zone three or zone four than to lose the ball in zone two. What I mean by that is if you get the ball here and you're under a lot of pressure, it's something that I feel like some players recognize towards the end of the season that like if you get stuck and you just push the ball around the bo along the boards and just run as fast as you can, um, and not like pushing the ball way out in front of you, but like just dribbling along these boards. Um, if someone touches you into the boards and you bang into them, fall down, right? That's a blue card on the other team. Um, also, like rather than just trying to pass the ball and lose it right here and then countering right back down us, right? Because you're stuck, they might give you the boards, and you can just advance the ball down the boards or even a lane to pass the ball down the boards. So recognize that. Okay, so there are um, there are better options than to lose the ball in zone two. If the worst case scenario, go down the board zone three into zone four and lose it down there. Um, also look for balls in the zone four, same as the defensive players. Uh, you get the ball as a midfielder in one of these positions. Uh, you might also see yourself as a second forward, right? If you are a goal scorer and play a lot as attacking midfielder, um, this might be your position. You might see this position a lot. Or you might end up cycling in these three, just to be honest. So um, with that, you know, look for those balls. Um, recognize your one-on-one -on -one situations where you can beat people. Um, but then also recognize when that could be a risk, depending on the zone that we're on. That's why I want to talk about zones before even getting into this. Because if I were to talk about zones and you didn't know what that meant, uh, then this wouldn't make sense. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of things that could go into midfielders, but anything in particular that we want to add here? Uh, yeah, I got one thing. It kind of covers... Um, I was thinking it was two things, but then I thought a little bit more about it. Pretty much, it's kind of like one. It's knowing that when you see, like, even you see, like, if I was playing with Beretti, I saw Beretti move forward with the ball, and I knew that we may lose the ball or something may happen, or see it's in a dangerous position going forward, and we may score. I also know the ball can go back, and they can transition just as quickly. So it's recognizing that you always need, even if you're not the defender and especially if you're one of the two other midfielders, to be in that covering position, especially when you, you know, aren't in a great position to receive the ball yourself. It's okay to cover back and always be ready for the uh, transition to come the other way because it more than often it always does happen. Um, yeah, that was what I was thinking. Right. So just to recap what you said, which I think is was, was a great point and something that I wish more people would recognize Unfortunately, it comes sometimes with just making mistakes and thinking what you could do differently in that case. But sometimes we have to like think pessimistically and think that we're going to lose the ball. And sometimes it comes a lot of times, especially like uh, a lot of players recognize it as they get older and recognize that, hey, look, I don't want to keep tracking back so much every single time, back and forth, back and forth, up and down the field, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I can play smarter and recognize, hey, there's a certain percentage chance that this person is going to lose the ball and I might want to cover for them. So I put in here like the certain covering aspect of it. Uh, and also I called it preventative defending where like you recognize in a situation where we might lose the ball. Um, you know, I'm, I think this is what you meant. Correct me if I'm wrong, but like, let's say, you know, um, 
you know, Beretti gets the ball here. He starts advancing the ball on the dribble through here. It might not make sense for you to just like continue this. You might have to like stay back for him or recognize, you know, if he, if there's a player like trapped right here, trying to get out, someone's, uh, if you, someone can, uh, mute here, I'll mute them. Um, uh, I think also, maybe this is, correct me if I'm wrong, Alex, but like an example of like this player is like stuck here and can't really move forward and is like fighting for the ball stuck on the boards. This player wouldn't like move to this side to provide support. He would be more dropping into this side, just expecting that that ball could be played past that player into the defense and then win the ball. Because this player just makes like an overlapping run and says, hey, play me, play me, play me. And he loses the ball and then we end up in a bad situation uh, another characteristic what we talked about the other day uh, we were working on this when we were talking about zone two was if the defender got the ball here and played that ball and made that diagonal run through that this player needs to be dropping in to play a bit of preventive preventative defense um, and recognizing that like hey look we have the ball but recognize we could lose it uh, we might not think of that as a midfielder's responsibility but it 100% is or even if we yeah. have in the boards in our own zone one here you know and we're trying to get yeah. it out right instead of you like making a run up in here or hanging out in here maybe it might make more sense for you to drop back in here expecting that he's going to lose the ball but still providing an option to get out is that kind of uh along the lines of what you're saying no, yeah not exactly what I was thinking. There was actually a situation Saturday morning where it was kind of similar to this, but maybe slightly different enough to, to be worthy to talk about, um, where I'm not sure who had the ball, but I was behind them, and it was a one-on-three, and I was slightly in front at first, and I saw this happen, and I was like, there's no way they can – most likely can't get out of this. Um, and I was kind of in between. Maybe if I give them an option forward, maybe they can get out, but also if they lose the ball too quickly, then I can't get back if I do that. So it is kind of situational and knowing when when is the option to give them an option forward because it's possible. And I think that comes from knowing who the player is, right? And if you can give them that instead of doubt to beat that player or two players, right? Now it kind of depends if you're at a practice and it's you're it's not a not as game like, then yeah. you may just be an option forward and in not be always just checking back. But if it's, you know, an MASL game, I think in that situation every single time, even if it's Ken, I'm almost definitely going to be tracking back just in case. I'm going to be getting back, right? Because there's also going to be, I'm not going to be a target forward anyway, most likely. And so that target forward, right, will already be forward and there'll be an option. So my job as a midfielder or second forward, even in that scenario, right, if Ken is moving forward, if Gavin is moving forward and he beats those two defenders, it's okay that I'm further back because then I can still move forward after that happens, most likely, right? But it's always better to be in that space, in that covering space, just in case, especially if you have the fitness to do so, which is why we're training so hard, um, so that you can cover both sides of offense and defense, right? Defense always is first, so that's why you're always there. Yeah, I mean, I think we were underprepared last year for the season in many ways. Um, one being fitness, two being just tactical awareness, and I'm the one to blame for it. But, you know, I think that's something that we learned the hard way in a lot of cases was just making dumb mistakes. And then I would get all upset about it and then realize, like, dude, you haven't even explained some of this stuff to them. You can't get so mad about it. And that's why I've wanted to make this year a little bit different and to provide an explanation, especially for new players. A lot of us learned the hard way last year um, through just yeah. experiences. And, and with that, you know, we have to be able to expect, um, have that mindset that we might lose the ball, right? We, we this isn't going to be super pretty all the time. We're not going to have all these nice possessions like we do in futsal, right? We might have to, get rid of it sometimes and we might have to expect that we're gonna get thrown into the boards here and the ref not make a call and them counter back down our throats and if you aren't expecting that then you know one you're gonna be in for a surprise and two we're gonna get scored on a bunch so um, no that's a great point and it's very relative to all of this uh and do you mind if i say one other thing yeah 
So I love, I absolutely love all the fitness that we're all, that we're doing even at practice. And I love that Koi and David are having these fitness plans, right? And I think that maybe, I don't know, especially if you're new, you may not recognize this, but like you have to be fit for this. Like third line, second line, for it doesn't matter. Like I, I felt like before we did that first little scrimmage that I was most fit I'd ever been right especially kind of training and effort masl and then after maybe in the second quarter i was like oh my god i ran i came off and i was like oh my god can i keep doing this and luckily i was okay but like i man i'm running my ass off all the time like four or five days a week of hard fitness and then laying off a little bit right? and that still doesn't feel like enough so if you are just doing your fitness at practice and that's all you're doing all week it's not going to be enough yeah. you're not going to be able to track back, right? Yeah. So it's not just that, it's doing stuff on your own and doing stuff that can really challenge you and getting better. Yeah, that's, that's a, all I want. No, that's definitely the hardest thing about this is like, we're not a full-time club, but like the level we play at demands like a full-time fitness regimen. <laughs> it's yeah. it, it, it stinks because like, you know, like I think everyone is just underprepared because no one, none of the teams we play against train every day of the week and, and, you know, make this uh, a super big priority. Um, you know, I think we, we do a lot, but um, you know, the demands of everything are way more than, than they should be. And you guys sacrifice time and sacrifice a lot to be a part of this. And, and, you know, I, I struggle with that because I don't want someone to be like, man, like I'm giving way too much of my time for this. I'm making too many sacrifices. I don't want to do this. And we've had players that left because of that. But at the same time, I, I, I like, I know that that's what will like make you a better player. But then there's the whole other extreme of like, you know, of this being your only thing you're doing and it being your everything, and then take time away from, you know, things that you really care about, or even preventing you to, you know, take a job that you want, or like switching around your hours with your family, or not being able to spend enough time with your family. So like, I, I appreciate it. that's why I want I, I purposely went in and made it, you know, I, I, I always do stuff outside of of training and you know it might be not enough i always can i always have that internal battle like am i doing enough should i be doing more i know i i've done more in the past when it was my full-time profession and that was the only thing i was focused on i have done more in the past and like that's the internal battle that exists in me how much should i give and how much is like uh, you know how much is the right amount so I make sure to let you guys know that like, you know, the stuff that Brady and Koi have been putting together is like great stuff. Like that stuff I highly, highly, highly recommend, but wanted to also reiterate that it's optional. Like if you don't do it, it's not the, it's not going to be counted against you, but if you do do it, it's going to really prepare you for this season. Um, and it's just a different type of fitness, this game. It's, it's, it is. And it's something that no matter how fit you are going into the season, um, you're going to feel it. You're not going to end the game and be like, oh, that was easy. I can play it. I can play another one. <laughs> um, that, that's not the case, you know. Uh, you know, and there are times where you get put on the third line and, and you don't play as much as you would like and and think, yeah, I can play a full game right now. Um, but um, that's not the case if if you're playing in, in line one and line two throughout the, throughout the game. So uh, great point. I appreciate that, Alex. Um, anything else we want to add for midfielders? Uh, just to that point about, about fitness, um, you know, obviously being fit is important. And I mean, I know that for myself, when I'm fit, the game slows down um, and it helps tremendously. Yeah. They're not fit playing, especially playing, um, indoor arena feels like you're being tossed into a blender yeah and so being fit is important but uh, and at the same time um part of being fit is allowing your body to recover from uh bouts of intensity and so um 
you know, I have those doubts too of like, gosh, am I doing enough? Am I getting out there enough? And, and just remember that, you know, um, a guitar string that is too tight is bound to snap, right? And so if you're getting in your fitness, great. That's a great analogy. Get, get, get your fitness in, but also get your rest and recovery uh which doesn't necessarily you know not to say like be a go be a couch potato you know active recovery like stretching and foam rolling and just doing the right things but making sure there's that element too because the masl season already is intense on its own and if you're adding too much um weight training or or you know even hit training and not letting your body recover I mean, I know for myself, that's what, you know, last season I, I couldn't even end it because I had a groin injury, right? Because maybe I, maybe I was trying too hard to be fit without putting in the, the recovery time as well. So just putting that in, out there to keep in mind. And once again, if you guys think of something and want to add another time, please let me know. Okay. Um, Forwards. Okay. I was very short on this because I could probably go on forever because it's the one I have most experience with. Um, but I just put this out there, you know, forwards in general, uh, we want to something that's different from outdoor. You might, and this happens a lot. Players come in, think they're forwards and they don't play any defense. Um, and you know, the ball advance up the field and you just stay at midfield. Some teams do this. Some teams literally just have their forwards stay up the field and not play any defense. That's not how we play, and that's not how the game's played at the next level. So we're not going to get in bad habits. Um, so forwards play defense, and they track behind the ball. You know, you're going to get behind the ball, you're going to play defense. If you do not, then you just won't play here. If you want to find a team where you don't have to play defense and just stay up top and do that, by all means, do that. But here – our forwards play defense. They work hard defensively and they track behind the ball. Um, target forwards specifically, uh, we want the target forwards to hold up the ball. We want you guys to create scoring opportunities and also be able to use the wall um, to be able to play passes off the walls to players that are crashing the boxes. These are all things that obviously as a forward and outdoor, you create scoring opportunities, but you might not have to hold up the ball as much in outdoor as you do in arena soccer. That's a really, really important skill holding up the ball. Sometimes that, that is overlooked in outdoor soccer. I know when I was a target forward in outdoor soccer, I was overlooked as a target forward because I would hold the ball up, lay the ball off to someone, that guy play the through ball. And then someone make a third man run and score where the person who played the ball through got the assist. Another guy scored even though I held the ball up and create and help create the play, I didn't get a stat from it. So in arena soccer, you know, target forwards are, are very, very well sought after because it's a, it's, it's a skill that not everyone has. So being able to hold the ball uh, and then be able to understand how the walls work as well and recognize your angles, where to play the ball off the walls. Um, that's really important from a target perspective. Um, also, um, the second forward is the so the target forward is this guy, the target up the field. The second forward uh, is also sometimes very high up the field looking for the ball, but really we want that second forward um, somewhere in zone. If the ball is in zone two, we want this guy somewhere in the middle of zone three. Doesn't always have to be in the middle. Maybe he checks wide a little bit here. Maybe he checks wide this way. Um, but when the ball is played into a corner, he's going to be there to support. He's either going to make this run here. He's going to make this run back post. Maybe he checks in here a little bit more to receive it. Um, that second forward is just a different position than outdoor. Um, and don't check too far back. You know, if this player is here, if he's checking too far back into here, he's just bringing pressure with him. Um, he wants to be somewhere in the middle of this zone when building out of zone two. Um, also 
Um, you're gonna be the first support the target forward. I already said that, but just making sure that you are offering that support. Anything that we want to add here to either the target forward position or second forward position? Uh, I'll go. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I would say be be selfless. You know, this is uh something that I personally had to learn quickly. You know, I was used to playing indoor and being the guy that turns and shoots the ball every single time. And here it's hold the ball, let the team come up and lay it off, just like in futsal. Um, so be selfless, you know, you're you it's it's a whole different you're a forward, but not really a, a true forward. You're not the scoring forward. You're more for the team. Uh, which is something that I learned along the way. Yeah. You might actually lead the team in assists based off of your target. You might, you might have more assists than goals as a target forward, just because of being able to release that pressure and hold the ball up and having a selfless, uh, selfish selflessness about you. Sorry, go ahead. Whoever just started talking. Yeah. I was just going to say as a midfielder and attacker, when you're trying to score goals, I think it's great to be selfless and uh, it's it's better to find a pass or your teammate where he's at a better position to score. But you look at the best forwards and they take so many shots and they got to try and try to score. So take opportunities by yourself sometimes. Yeah. yeah and, and, and sorry, Josh. Um, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. kind of where I wanted to add my second point was, you know, recognize mismatches. Um, I think a lot of the times we, we, we see a mismatch and we kind of double, you know, we, we double think a little bit and we don't play the ball, but like, if I'm playing like, for example, for me, right. I'm, I'm a bigger guy. If I'm up against somebody that's at least 50 pounds less than me, you know, like recognize that play the ball, know that, or at least trust that I'm going to hold the ball against that player. And then we, we go from there. Yeah. And that's something, Jose, just to compliment you on something that I've just seen you do really, really well, um, especially when it comes to futsal, because I've, you know, when I first met Jose last year, you know, it was right before the arena soccer season. I know he was transitioning um, and had a few injuries too, but, you know, I'd seen a lot of like great things from him and just knew that like, if, if he was able to consistently hold the ball up, one, because of his body, and two, because he is able to score two, he could be very, very, very dangerous player. So with that, you know, seeing how he played in futsal throughout the past year and how a lot of goals were scored because of his hold-up play, the players like him and, and Mike Geiselhart did a really good job of it too, holding up the ball and laying the ball off and being selfless in those cases – you know, you create a lot of opportunities when you don't even recognize. Um, and there are times where when we're playing on a bigger field, you know, by holding up the ball um, and just providing players time to get up the field, you are doing a huge favor and you're a huge asset in the process of it. So I agree on both sides, you know, Nico mentioning take open shot or take shots. Yeah, I agree. Take shots when you're open. And I think one of the biggest things is, you know, Take your take your chances. I think our the very first arena soccer team I played on, uh, my coach would would yell at us and he would say, you know, we we're only taking open chances. We also need to take half chances. And that was the next point I wanted to add. And I think that if you know, if you are someone that has has scored a lot in the past, um, then take your half chances. But if you're someone that you know just struggles hitting a hitting a hard consistent shot and isn't taking a lot of good shots and you're losing the ball or you're taking shots every time you get the ball, then there's going to be a problem. Uh, so, you know, take your half chances uh, every once in, like if you realize that, you know, there's a not an open lane, uh, then play it and then take it. But if there's a better option to play and you just lost the ball three times, uh, then probably shouldn't take that shot. Um, so, so recognizing that, um, I agree on both sides, making sure that we are being selfless in the process of it, taking our open shots and recognizing those mismatches. I also add to midfielders, because if you know you can beat a guy, then take them. If I know that I have 
someone that's smaller that's marking me, then I'm going to demand the ball, demand it. Or a player that I've consistently just beat up on the entire game, I'm going to demand the ball. Um, And, you know, that's something that, you know, when we talk about target forwards, um, that's a balance that I've always struggled with too, is like, when are you like too big and too clunky? And when do you need to get fit or um, like, I guess like, the right weight was always something I struggled with. I've I've played soccer at 225 and I've played soccer at 165. <laughs> so I cannot see you at 225. Um, so you know, like when I'm 225, you can't touch me, right? But I also have trouble getting up and down the field and get injured more. When I'm 165, I'm moving up and down that field and I can run all day long. Um you know, I'm 175 now, but, you know, I was 225 at one point. Uh, and that was my, like, I thought like, I thought 205 was my best playing weight. So somewhere in the middle, but, you know, that's something that as a forward, you have to kind of balance and just find out. So we're talking about roles here of different positions that maybe don't exist in other outdoor or futsal or just some things just to be aware of in i guess soccer in general might not necessarily be the first thing you think about you know if you get put on a roster you might think i'm gonna play today no matter what that's not always the case we are required to bring 16 players and sometimes we need all 16 guys and sometimes we're gonna go through and play not all 16 guys Uh, i try especially on away games to make sure everyone sees the field at least for a shift but that's not always the case, especially if you are a backup goalkeeper. So I wrote uh, GK2, the backup goalkeeper for a game. Um, you may not play during that game. It might be a really close game, and I want the starter to stay in for the whole game. You might be splitting time as the second goalkeeper, right? You might split time right at halftime. We switch out and just do that. You might end up getting subbed in in the first quarter because of an injury and play the entire game. Or you might get put in at the end of the game for quote unquote garbage minutes just to play a little bit. Um, It's a difficult role. And I have been on many rosters throughout my career where I've traveled 12 hours somewhere and didn't end up playing in the game. I've been on the receiving end of that and it stinks. And you look at it and you're like, oh, well, why did I even make this trip? Well, I will do my best throughout to get players playing time, but as a backup goalkeeper, just know that you may not play. And if you're not okay with that, let me know ahead of time or let me know your thoughts. And I want to be able to cater to everyone's requests, but it also isn't rec soccer. Um, this is not everyone plays equal minute soccer. Um, pretty much that's, I mean, I'll leave it at that. I, I don't want to spend too much long talking about this. Um, keep your gloves on, ready to play at any time. Uh, one thing that is frustrating, you know, if a goalkeeper has, if a goalkeeper gets a blue card, the goalkeeper now has to sub off of the field and the backup goalie has to step in. If we're waiting on you to go find your gloves, drag them out of your bag and put them on and lace them up and running around trying to put your shin guards on, you're not prepared. And to be honest, we'll probably concede because you're not ready. You need to be just as ready now with this new rule. You need to be just as ready as if you are a line three guy about to go in for any shift, which I'll talk more about line three later on, but you need to be ready. If your gloves aren't on, make sure they're like in your arms, like ready to go that you can slot on immediately, uh, that you already have your shin guards on and you're ready to go. If you're sitting there and your flip flops uh, without your gloves on, then I'll throw someone else in goal. I'll throw a pat in goal. I'll go step in goal if you're going to take forever and you're not ready because you're obviously not prepared in that moment. So keep your gloves on, ready to play at any time, or at least have them under your arm, keep them in your pocket, something that you can jump around the field. Um, be ready to go. Uh, another role is a runner. What's a runner? Uh, it's a position that exists in arena soccer. Uh, your job, your role as a runner is to play defense first and give someone a quick blow. So I've listed defense first. Number one, number one priority is not to concede. Do not concede. Your role is not to go in there and score a goal. Your role 
is not to go in there and take someone on 1v1 and create something. Your role is to go in there and make sure that the other team does not concede, whether you're in there for 20 seconds or in there for 90 seconds. You're in there running as hard as you can defensively. That's the runner position. And guess what? When you first play at the next level in the MASL, if you're playing in a, in a lower level right now, like the MASL 3, and you want to go play at the next level, guess what the very first position you will play is? You will most likely start off as a runner. And you will go in there as a third line guy and just run your butt off. Where your main thing might just be, hey, I'm super fit. I'm going to go in there and bust my butt and work as hard as I can for one minute. And you might be more valuable to a team than a super technical player, just to be honest with you, right? My first experience was as a runner. And then I became a second line guy. And then eventually I was a first line guy and I was a captain, right? So you work your way up. That's how it works, especially if you're a new player, right? That doesn't always, you know, it doesn't always translate at this level. There's some guys who are able to step in and play immediately, but the next level, typically you start as a runner. And you work as hard as you can defensively. You keep the ball, pass, and move. If you if you go in there as a third line guy and you just hang out up top, don't get back on defense, you won't be in future rosters. Plain and simple. So um, worst case, put the ball in the corner. If you get stuck and you're trapped, don't just dribble forward. Just pass the ball in the corner and go chase after it. Right. Go play defense. That's your that's your role. Now, why would the sport have these types of positions? Well. We have different lines. This is really important, especially if you're a new player. So please pay attention to this. There are three lines that we have. We have a line one, a line two, and a line three. And they do not get even playing time. You might be on line three and not step on the field throughout the whole game. You might be on line three and get a significant amount of shifts. Here's how it works. Line one, you will play significant minutes. These are your quote unquote starters. Whenever there's a, a timeout, uh, typically, we reset lines and you start back as line one again. Even if line one was just in, right? We usually start at line one and work sequentially. The beginning of a quarter, typically you start with line one. Line one will get the most minutes, plain and simple. Um, every 90 to 120 seconds. So you'll be somewhere in there between a minute and two minutes max. If you're in there for five minutes, you're going to get booted out of line one. Okay. So you go in there. Work hard, minute, two minutes, work as hard as you can. Work as hard as you possibly can. You might be in line one to start the game and score a goal 17 seconds into the game and you sub off. Maybe it. Okay, we our, our line did our job, right? I don't know if you any of you guys follow hockey, but there's a stat called plus minus that when you are on the ice, if your team scores, you get a plus. If you're on the ice and your team concedes a goal, then you get a minus. And so like your plus minus at the end, you might add it up and have a plus minus of two, right? Where your team scored three goals while you were on and one goal while you were off. So that's one way to judge a player if that's more of a defensive player. Hey, look, when I'm on, my shift doesn't concede. Hey, when I'm on the ice, you know, we don't concede. When I'm on the field, my team scores more than we actually let up goals. So it's a stat. If you go through your shift and your team didn't score and you didn't concede, probably did a good job, right? If you go on the shift and your team scores and you didn't let up a goal, that was a good shift. And if you look at it, you take it one shift at a time and you isolate each one of your shifts and rewind it and look at it and be like, what could I do differently in this one minute I was on the field? What could I do differently? So line one will play anywhere between 90 to 120 seconds, you know, a minute and a half to two minutes. Um, <clears throat> you may also get sub to line two at some point in the game. If you're not effective, if there's someone else that's maybe playing really well, or maybe we just want to tactically switch things up, know that you might get switched to line two. Nothing personal. It might just be a tactical switch, right? It might be, hey, look, you lost the ball, or hey, look, we want to add more defensive players in the line one. Um, sometimes we make mistakes in the way that we originally line up the lines and say, Hey, look, we need a change. So <clears throat> we might make those changes line one, line two. Sometimes even pairings are important. Who's your sub buddy with line two. Um, and then also, you know, you might also 
ask your line three sub buddy to step in for a shift. So let's say you're in line one, you know who your line two sub partner is, and then you know who your line three sub partner is. You, you're on line one, you run off the field, and you're huffing and puffing, and line two's out there. You might turn to line three, whoever is your guy, not some random player, because this happened last year and it made me really upset. You just turn to some random player and said, hey, can you step on for me? No, no, no. You stay who I tell you is on your line. So you go to your line three guy. Even if you don't like who you who I put on that line or your coach put on that line, you go to him and say, hey, look, uh, I need you to step on. Give me just like a 45 second blow. And that person is now designated as a runner. And they say, all right, I got you. And as soon as line two runs off, that line three just runs around, plays great defense, gets the ball, connects a pass, runs up the field, gets the ball, connects a pass, and subs off. There you go. You did your job. And I'm telling you what, you will get more noticed doing that than going on and and scoring a goal um, in your shift, to be honest. Because I'm looking specifically at can this player step in and fulfill a role? We've got guys that can score. I know that if you're on line three, that you probably can score as well. But that's not necessarily your role in that moment. You might score a goal. And that's awesome. You might be in the right spot, at the right time. But if you go in there as a line three player and take five shots, that's probably not your role. Okay. So knowing the difference between lines, you have line one and you have line two. Line one players, I will give the authority to pull a line three guy and say, hey, look, I need you guys, I need you to make the sub right? I need to stay on and then communicate with that, communicate that with me after the fact, or when I get off, be like, Hey, I need whoever step on for me for a shift. And that's fine. Right. Especially in the third quarter, the end of the second quarter. And I'd say the mid of the third quarter, people start needing extra shifts. Um, The fourth quarter, just adrenaline and wanting to win alone. Sometimes you're able to stay on a little bit longer, but the end of the second quarter and the midway through the third quarter, those are typically good times to pull your line three guy. Don't be like sympathetic for him and only sub him on because he hasn't played that game. If you honestly need a guy and you're on the first in the first line, then then ask and I tell the guy, say, hey, look, I need you to step on, give him a time frame, and then you're the one that calls him off. Line one guys will be vocal. I've already communicated this last year, but if you're on line one, um, you need to be vocal and the one that's helping dictate subs on your line, right? Mm-hmm. Tell line two when 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 you once you're once you're ready, get back out on the field. Take your shift, get out, take it, get out. Line two, you know, you're gonna play an average amount of minutes. Your shifts are gonna be somewhere between a minute to 90 seconds. Sometimes it might be shorter. Um, you know, you might get subbed into line one based off of your performance. In the Fredericksburg game, Alex Stewart ended up getting pulled up to line one because Shipley got injured, right? Uh line two, um, also know that you might actually get subbed into line two or let me rephrase this line two or line three at some point in the game. You might get, I might put someone else in line two and you might move down the line three, right? Maybe that's already predetermined before the game starts. Hey, look at the end of the first quarter, you're in line two at the end of at the second quarter, you're in line three might already be predictated or it might be because of injuries or just power play settings. Typically someone that's on a def- defensive power play subs off. They're super tired. They might call their line three to step on and it might be several shifts that they're calling their line three on even more of a reason not to give up dumb blue cards. Okay. Um, line three, your shifts max are 60 seconds. Shouldn't be stuck on the field for very long, right? Don't expect to provide much offensive output. Go out there and take five or six shots. That's not your job. That's not your role. Okay. In training, the way you are, the way that you get extra more, I guess, uh, I guess a better look at line one or line two, that's when you perform in training and we'll observe that and put you as a line one or line two guy. When you're a line three guy, it's not your job to be an offensive stud. It's not your job. You might go out there and do a good job, but it's really not your job. Okay. It's not your job to go out there and take a bunch of shots. 60 seconds max, provide a blow for your guy, give him a quick breather. And the same, the same priorities as a runner, you know, you're not conceding. Um, you also may not play in the game. There's not, there's a chance. Um, I think last game line three played in every or last year for, for us line three players, I believe played in every game. Um, maybe I'm wrong, 
but that's not always the case. If you're watching top level MASL games, some line three guys do not step in during the game, right? Um, and that's just the reality of it. Uh, you may only see a, see a few shifts throughout the game. You might only step on for one shift throughout the entire game. Um, or maybe you get subbed in the line two at some point. You now have a bit more of a role and you go out there and you do your job. Just goes into the roles as I'm talking about. To know your role. If I tell you you're on line one throughout that game, you have a good idea of what your role is. We can't be four games into the season and you still learn your role based off of what line you're on. If you go in, you're a line two guy, accept that role for that game. And the way you, that you maybe earn your way to line one is by doing your job and also performing well in training. And we'll mix it up. Okay, so with that, just be aware of what your role is throughout. And this isn't just for you know the Baltimore Kings. This goes for any team. Whenever you step on the field, play within yourself, know your role, and work hard because that's what's going to get you noticed. I rewatch the film. All of you guys will rewatch the film. Some of you guys are just uh, very stubborn or just can't see maybe some objective truths that exist through the game that you guys can't pick up on. You don't realize you gave the ball away five times doing the same thing, yet you keep doing the same thing over and over and over again, no matter how many times you watch yourself. Um, or there are many of you that watch the film, learn from it and say, I'm not going to do that again. I'm going to make a point not to. And we learn from our mistakes, right? We're not going to go games without making mistakes. That's not going to happen. But when you make mistakes, accept it and get better. And don't make that same mistake over and over and over and over again. Okay. If you give up five top of the arc reset goal or resets, just blasting the ball. And you're like, oh, I forgot. Oh, I forgot. Oh, I forgot. Well, I'm going to forget to put you in the roster the next game. All right. So we have to learn from our mistakes. We have to. Um, so these are the roles. The assignment is very short for this. Uh, this is asking you to watch the third quarter of the semifinal game and to watch their off the ball movement, defense, and any general patterns that you pick up on. Watch one team's player. So like if you're a target forward, watch, pick one of the teams and pick their target forward. Pick Chihuahua's target forward. Pick um, San Diego soccer's target forward and who their sub buddy is and follow them. Watch how they sub on and on off the field. Watch their off the ball movement. When the ball is with the defense, watch what the target forward is doing and watch specifically your position. Okay. So that's the point of this assignment position specific. We're going to follow that for this assignment as well. So watch it. Feel free to watch the fourth quarter as well. The fourth quarter is pretty interesting. There's actually, it's a playoff game. And since they end up tying 1-1 in the end, uh, they go to a mini game, which is like the playoff of the playoff and the winner take all. So if you want to watch beyond just the third quarter, that's fine. But this game, the third quarter is very interesting. And that is the position specific project.